It's just after 3.30 a.m. when Maya and I are called up to the office. The bar is empty except for us and a few managers. All the security staff are gone. All the other bartenders are leaving out the front door of the large establishment while Maya and I walk toward the back. Usually, when we're called up to the office, it's because there's a problem with our registers. If we're off by a large amount, we have to pay the difference from our tips. It sucks, but it's part of the job. Maya and I head through the seldom used kitchen. Just before the rear door that leads to the alley, we take a right and go up a flight of concrete and metal stairs to the office, which sits in the back of the building, sandwiched between the first and second floors of the establishment. I'm surprised to find the outer office door unlocked. It's almost always locked at the end of the night because of all the money kept in there. I open it and allow Maya to walk inside the outer office. Quick movement comes from inside as a man wearing black clothes and a black ski mask rushes out of the nearby office bathroom and grabs Maya, putting a gun to her head. Simultaneously, before the shock has a chance to set in, I hear footsteps rushing down from upstairs. I look up the flight of stairs leading to the second floor and see another man in a black ski mask pointing a gun at me. Get in there, the guy says. Maya and I, both shocked into silence, are ushered into the inner office, where two of the managers are. Lee, the general manager, sits behind the desk. Mary, who's an assistant manager, sits in a chair to the side of the desk. There's a third masked man in the office, covering the two managers with a pistol. I notice that all three men have suppressors on their pistols. The only person missing is Carlo, the other assistant manager, who's usually making the rounds to lock the place up at this time of night. Phones, the guy nearest me says with a handout. Maya and I produce our phones and give them over to the guy, who pockets them. I assume Mary and Lee have already surrendered their phones. We're arrayed outside the inner office because there's not enough room for all of us to fit in there. The closed and locked liquor closet, where all the liquor deliveries are inventoried and stored, is at my back. Shelves full of random stuff take up much of the surrounding room. The small bathroom is in one corner, near the outer office door. Is there anyone else in the building? The masked man in the office asks Lee. I immediately recognize his voice. It's Jeremy. With that realization comes the sure knowledge that this isn't some run-of-the-mill robbery. It's more than that, and it's likely going to end with my death. My limbs go cold, and my alcohol-buzzed head feels light, like it wants to float away. Lee looks at me. Did the other bartenders leave? Yeah, I say, my voice squeaking. That's it, Lee says. There's no one else. Jeremy looks at the guy who came down from upstairs. Out of the corner of my eye, I see the guy shake his head. Why are you lying to me? Jeremy asks Lee. He shifts his pistol and shoots Mary in the face, blasting her brains out all over the inner office wall. Maya screams, but one of the guys backhands her in the mouth. She stumbles back and raises her hands to her mouth, but she stops screaming. I can do nothing but stare at the little bits of gray-pink brain sliding down the bloody wall. This isn't happening, I think. Mary lets out a choked gurgle, her body twitching as blood runs down from the hole in her face. This is happening, some weak voice says in my head. This is happening, and you have to do something or you're all dead. It's my fault that Jeremy's here. It's my fault that Mary's brains are now sliding down the wall. I have no doubt about that. I feel like I'm going to be sick as Jeremy points the gun back at Lee. Let's try this one more time. Is there anyone else left in the bar? The bar is pretty busy as I come back from break with a full stomach and an urge to have a drink. It's eight o'clock and I worked happy hour. So I've been at the bar since two in the afternoon. Since the bars in Austin close at 2 a.m., and we usually don't get out until 3.30 or 4, I'm in for a long night. My half-hour break did me some good. 
but tonight's the first night in a long time that I haven't gone to have a couple of drinks with my dinner. I'm trying to cut back on the drinking. Some bars in town have a zero tolerance drinking rule that they actually enforce, but they are few and far between. Most of the people I hang out with work at the other bars downtown and most of them have a few drinks during their shift. Hell, some of them have more than a few. It's really easy to do when you're slinging drinks. Random customers, friends, and regulars often offer to buy shots. That's just the way it is. Half the people who work in this industry are functioning alcoholics, at least in Austin. I can't speak for other places, but I bet it's similar. And there's one major benefit of getting loose during the shift. It's easier to deal with the assholes who inevitably come in. At least, it used to be that way for me. Lately, after a few drinks, I've been having anger problems. Stuff that, in the past, wouldn't have bothered me for more than a few seconds, now seems to stick with me for a whole shift. I fume on the shitty tip, or the rude customer, or the offhand comment which is why I'm trying to stop drinking on shift. I can't be losing my shit about the little things. That's not to say there are no appropriate times to lose my shit. I work at one of the busiest college bars in Austin, so you can imagine the clientele. Most people are cool, but there are always a few assholes and a few troublemakers. It's rare to go through a Friday or Saturday night without having to kick a few people out of the bar for breaking the common sense rules that any bar has in place. But as I come back from break, I'm hoping I won't have to kick anyone out. That would be nice. I'm not a big fan of confrontation. I scan the crowd in front of the bar as I pick up my bar key and stick a towel in my back belt loop. Maya grabs a couple of beers out of the trough and pops the caps off with her bar key. How was dinner? Good, I say, quickly checking that I have enough limes, ice, straws, and napkins. I had a Korean barbecue burrito. Oh, those are so good, Maya says, setting the beers down in front of the customer and telling him the total. Did you get the fried egg inside? Of course. Why didn't you bring me one? I smile. Next time. Maya is a short, dark-haired girl with big green eyes and the figure of a gymnast. I like working with her not only because she's funny and we get along well, but because male customers love her and tend to tip a lot just because she's gorgeous and knows how to flirt. Since we split tips, I figure tonight's haul will be a good one. And we have a kind of unspoken agreement. I usually pick up the slack so she can take some time with the big tippers, making sure they're taken care of so they'll part with that sweet dough whenever they close out their tabs. It's a pretty good system. A division of labor, you might call it. Plus, she's one of the few bartenders who doesn't drink, which will help keep me on track. The place we work is large, with two stories and four different bars. The main doors lead onto a courtyard. Immediately to the left once you enter, a staircase leads to the upstairs patio which has two bars. On the weekends, we have a DJ up there. People can look out onto the 6th Street crowds or down into the courtyard while they drink upstairs. If you take a right through the main doors and out of the courtyard, you get to the bar where Maya and I are working tonight. Near the back of the large room, there's a stage where a live band will start playing around nine. Then there's another bar just over to the left of the stage in another room with the lounge area nearby. All told, there are eight bartenders working on the weekends, along with two barbacks and 10 security staff. It's a big operation, and aside from the aforementioned assholes, bartending is pretty fun. I probably won't want to do it for much longer, but since I'm 25 and in no rush to move past my partying era, it's a great job for me. It takes me 15 minutes to get back into the flow of things, helping Maya thin out the crowd that is gathered in front of our bar. By the time I'm moving along like my joints are oiled and I was born with a shaker tin in my hand, the thought of having a drink is a distant one, like a figure on the horizon. Pretty soon, the band starts up and I can barely hear myself think. More people hear the music through the open windows and pour into the bar, 
slowing only long enough to have their IDs checked by the door guys. I'm in the middle of fixing shots for a group of overexcited 20-something women out for a bachelor party when I feel Maya grab my arm. I glance down at her, seeing the look of concern on her face. Being nearly a foot taller than her, I hunch down so she can speak into my ear. See the man in the deep V-neck shirt? She asks. Yeah, I say. He looks to be in his late thirties, with two tanned skin, a smug smile on his face, and a hairstyle that looks like it's modeled after Brad Pitt's character from Fight Club. His white, deep V-neck t-shirt shows off too much of a perfectly waxed chest. Can you please serve him? Maya asks. I can't deal with him tonight. What did he do? He's just a creep. So I'm gonna go to the bathroom for a few minutes while you serve him. Hopefully he'll get the message and leave. Yeah, okay, no problem. She squeezes my arm. Thanks. Then she hurries out from behind the bar and makes a beeline for the back. The guy follows her with his eyes, smiling like a cartoon wolf. I take care of the people who got to the bar first. The guy waits his turn and then leans on the bar. I tilt an ear toward him. I'm gonna wait for Maya, he says. I don't know when she'll be back, I say. I can get you something right now. No, he says. His tone causes me to turn and look at him. There's a challenge in his face, like he wants an argument. Okay, I say, but do me a favor and wait at the end of the bar so I can serve people until you're ready. No, he says again, flashing his vulpine smile. I feel my cheeks flush with a surge of annoyance, and suddenly, I'm thinking about having a drink, or two. If I'd been drinking tonight, I probably would have already started to kick the guy out. But since I'm sober, I managed to swallow my mounting anger and move to serve the other people waiting for drinks. Meanwhile, I can feel the guy's eyes on me, and I can see his smirk out of the corner of my eye. After several minutes, I glance toward the back and see Maya returning to the bar. She spots the guy and looks at me, a small pout on her lips. I shrug and mouth, sorry. When she walks behind the bar, she says, hey Jeremy, to the guy, like she's actually happy to see him. Maya's good, she could be an actress. Another wave of customers comes in and the next 10 minutes pass in a blur of hissing beers, glugging liquor bottles and shouted drink orders. After initially serving him a beer, Maya has been doing her best to ignore Jeremy, but he has posted himself right in front of her workstation. Every time she has to make a drink, he's right in her face, leaning over, whispering to her. There's a lull in business, and I pour myself a cup of water. I'm drinking it when Maya shouts, drawing my attention. Jeremy is leaning way over, gripping Maya's upper arm in one highly manicured fist a look of constipation on his face. I don't think, I just act. It takes me precious seconds to move out from behind the bar, weaving through the people who are watching the band play. As I approach Jeremy, he suddenly lets Maya go and turns toward me, raising his hands and putting that smirk back on his face. Get the hell out! Maya screams at the man, drawing the attention of several patrons. I say nothing. I grab Jeremy by the upper arm, much like he was just grabbing Maya and turned him toward the exit. I've kicked a lot of people out of the bar, and a lot of them put up a fight, but not in the literal sense. Most of them simply refused to budge, forcing us to gather several door guys to get them out, even though we're technically not supposed to lay hands on them. Others try to talk their way out of it, saying things like, but my friends are in here, or I didn't do anything wrong. Then there's my favorite. Do you know who I am? I'll steal your ass into the ground. I can count on one hand the number of times someone has thrown a punch at me or a member of the staff. And when they do that, it never ends well for them. So I'm not expecting Jeremy to do anything but put up token resistance, which is why his punch catches me off guard. I see it coming at the last moment, but I'm not fast enough. His fist connects with my chin snapping my teeth together with an impact that immediately seats a headache deep in my brain. Maybe I'm lucky I have hold of his right hand, forcing him to hit with his left. Maybe he just isn't that strong. Either way, I don't go down. 
I don't stumble, and I don't let go of his arm. No, I don't do any of those things, but I do get really fucking mad. I'm vaguely aware of Maya screaming for security as I swing my right hand up and open palm slap Jeremy in the face, right over his eyes. His head rocks back, but I keep my hand there, covering his eyes and grabbing his head as I pivot and slam my knee into his gut. He doubles over, so I let go of his left arm and wrap my arm around his neck, putting him in a headlock. He struggles and tries to stand, so I hunker down, flexing my arm, choking him. He wraps his right arm around my back and throws a blind punch with his left, aiming for my crotch and hitting my thigh instead. This only makes me matter. A couple of security guys run in. These aren't the massive guys you see in movies that can handle everything you throw at them. They're just 20-something kids who need a job while they go to school or figure their lives out. But while they're not big buff dudes, they're also not small. One of them is a soft-spoken black guy named Aaron. The other is a wiry white guy named Terrence. They immediately rush forward, and Terrence grabs Jeremy's left arm while Aaron circles around and grabs the guy by the back of his belt. Working together, we all start moving him. I can feel the eyes of the patrons on us, but I don't care. My attention is on Jeremy. To the back! I shout at the security guys. Terrence glances at me as if to question if I'm sure. He sees the look on my face and does what I want, and we drag Jeremy to the back, through the small kitchen that's only used for private parties, past the back staircase that leads to the second floor, and out the door into the alley. Jeremy fights us the whole time, and as we go, I taste blood in my mouth. I feel around with my tongue and find that my right incisor has been chipped. The bottom half is gone. I may have swallowed it or spit it out while fighting with Jeremy. Toss him down, I say as we get to the alley. We throw Jeremy against a dumpster and he splashes into a puddle of foul-smelling trash juice. As he goes to get to his feet, I reel back and kick him in the side of the head. He goes back down in the puddle. I move forward, the anger controlling me now, thinking I'll stomp the asshole's head in. But Aaron and Terrence grab me by the arms. Whoa, dude, Aaron says. Chill out. You got him good. Look at him. Yeah, you don't want to go to prison over this asshole, right? Terrence asks. Chest heaving with anger, I look down at Jeremy. He's still conscious, but barely. The side of his head is bleeding where my shoe caught him. Blood trickles from his nostrils, probably from when I slapped him, hitting the bridge of his nose with the base of my palm. Okay, I say, coming back to myself. Okay, I'm good. Just let me go. The two guys let me go. I kneel next to Jeremy and grab his face, tilting it toward me. Stay the fuck out of this bar, I say. Jeremy's eyes slowly gain focus, and the muscles of his cheeks flex under my fingers as he smiles at me. This time, he shows his teeth, which are tinted with blood. The anger rushes through me again, and I yank his head toward me before slamming it into the dumpster with a thud. It isn't very hard, but Terrence and Aaron grab me again anyway and pull me back into the bar. As the door shuts, I get one last look at Jeremy. He's still smiling. A sudden jolt of fear mixes with my anger, serving to smother the fading rage. I'm still shaking when I get back to Maya at the bar. But now, I'm not sure if it's because of the residual anger or the strange, implacable fear I can't seem to shake. What happened? Maya asks. I grab a plastic shot glass and snag a bottle of Jameson off the shelf. Just as I'm about to upend the bottle to pour myself a shot, Maya stops me with a hand on my forearm. I thought you were trying to stop, she says. I was, until that asshole came in. Jesus, your tooth, are you okay? I'm all right, I say. Maya's soothing touch serving to calm my shaking. Don't let him push you over this edge, she says, talking about the booze. You're stronger than that. Besides, what if the cops come? I wouldn't be surprised if he reported it even though he threw the first punch. That was a good point. I hadn't thought about the possibility that Jeremy would go to the cops. I should have thought about that before I decided to take him out the back door instead of just tossing him out the front. But I'd been too angry to think. I guess I didn't need booze to get pissed after all. Yeah, I say, replacing the bottle on the shelf and putting the plastic shot glass 
back on the top of the stack next to my ice well. Hey, can I get a drink, please? Some woman calls from the bar. Take a few minutes if you want, Maya says. I can handle this. I'm good, I say. Let's finish this goddamn shift and get the hell out of here. Two TABC officers walk into the bar just before closing time. TABC stands for Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission, and the officers who work for the state agency are what we call bar cops. They're literally cops, carry guns and everything, but the bars, restaurants, and liquor stores are their purview. The two officers stride directly toward the bar where Maya and I are working. One's a white guy with a buzz cut, the other is a Hispanic guy with a buzz cut. They both wear khaki pants and navy blue polo shirts with yellow badges embroidered on the breasts. And they both have bellies so big, I doubt they could run 15 yards without tipping over. Everything's bigger in Texas, even cops' guts. Sir, we'd like to speak with you and your manager now, the Hispanic cop says to me. I glance at Maya, trying to convey a thanks for saving my ass look before I wipe my hands on my bar towel and say, yeah, okay. It's pretty clear that Jeremy dropped a dime on me. As I come around the bar, the white cop says, What's your name, sir? Ethan, I say. Last name? Whitmer. Is your manager around? Yeah, that's where I'm taking you. I lead the two cops back the same way the two security guys and I dragged Jeremy hours earlier. Only this time, when we reach the stairs next to the back door, I go up them. The office is on a weird kind of in-between floor between the first and second floors. The general manager, a heavy six foot five guy named Lee, sits behind a desk in the inner office, getting ready to do the final rounds of the night. He looks up and his face doesn't even change when he sees two TABC officers walking in with one of his bartenders. He's like that, unflappable. What's up? Lee asks. Are you the manager of this establishment? The Hispanic guy asks. Yeah? Lee says, standing up and coming around the desk. Lee Hunt. I'm Officer Santos, and this is Officer Keller. We had a complaint that your bartender, Mr. Whitmer, I say. Mr. Whitmer here has been drinking tonight. Santos stops talking and looks between me and Lee, as though expecting us to drop to our knees and say, Yes, officer, he's been drinking, but please have mercy on us. Okay, Lee says, looking at me. You've been drinking tonight, Ethan? No, I say. Good, Lee says. Well, that was easy. I appreciate you guys stopping by. I don't appreciate your tone, Mr. Hunt, Santos says. Listen, I've got a bar to run, guys. I know how this goes. I've worked in Texas bars my whole life. If you're going to breathalyze them, go for it. If not... Can we let him get back to work? He's got to close down his register and clean his bar soon. We'll do that, Mr. Hunt. But if he's found to be intoxicated, I will have no choice but to find this establishment. And if it happens again, we could revoke your liquor license. Lee crosses his arms and sits on the edge of his desk, looking impatient. Officer Keller produces a breathalyzer and has me blow into it. It comes up zeros. I guess whoever dropped that tip was messing with you guys, huh? Lee says. Keep your noses clean, gentlemen, Santos says before the two of them head out of the office. Fucking bar cops, Lee says when they're gone. I have half a mind to go take a shot right now. Want one? Nah, I'm good, I say. I'm gonna head back down. Hey, you know what that was about? You pissed someone off lately? Yeah, I tell him. Lee was the first person I ever saw take a guy out the back door, so I know I can be honest with him. Some guy was grabbing at Maya earlier tonight. Punched me when I tried to get him to leave. Chipped my goddamn tooth. Me and a couple of the guys took him out the back. Lee stands up and peers at my mouth as I show him my chipped incisor. Fuck, where was I? I shrug. Well, do me a favor and keep things clean for the next couple of weeks, will you? I nod. Was planning on it anyway. I lean on one of the rooftop bars, taking a breath and watching the door guys herd the stragglers down the stairs toward the front door. It's just after 2 a.m. and Saturday night has gone off without much of an issue. Certainly nothing like yesterday. 
I can see Maya across the rooftop patio at the other bar. Even though we weren't put together tonight, I was glad to be able to keep an eye on her. It seemed like every chance I got, I scanned the entire rooftop for any sign of Jeremy, but I never saw him. Maybe he got the message. The bartender I'm partnered with, Dion, nudges me. I turn to see that he's holding two shot glasses, both containing a double shot of some golden amber liquid. I've refrained from drinking all night, but now I don't think much about it. I take the plastic shot glass, bump it with Dion's, and down the shot. The whiskey stings my throat and immediately warms my stomach. As I turn to start counting my register, I feel the soft buzz settle itself at the base of my brain. Now, the floodgates are open, and I take three more shots in the hour and change it takes me and Dion to finish our closing duties. I've got a good buzz on by the time I go downstairs to wait with the other bartenders for the go-ahead to leave. So much for keeping things clean. After about 15 minutes, Lee calls down from the little office window. Everyone but Ethan and Maya are good to go, he says. I groan, knowing I'll have to pay the difference if my register is off. All the other bartenders get up from the tables, push in the chairs, and head for the door. Need me to wait for you? Alex, Maya's good friend and a fellow bartender, asks. I can walk her to her car when we're gone, I say. Okay, I appreciate it, Maya says. No need to wait. Alex nods and leaves as Maya and I head back toward the kitchen to go up to the office. The bar is quiet. The only people left inside are me, Maya, and three managers. I'm surprised to find the outer office door unlocked. It's almost always locked at the end of the night because of all the money kept in there. I open it and allow Maya to walk inside. Then, before I know what's happening, two guys in masks are pointing guns at us. Maya and I, both shocked into silence, are ushered to the inner office, where Lee and Mary are. There's a third masked man in the office, covering the general manager and assistant manager with a pistol. I notice that all three men have suppressors on their weapons. The only person missing is Carlo, the other assistant manager, who's usually making the rounds to lock the place up at this time of night. Phones, the guy nearest me says. Maya and I produce our phones and give them over to the guy who pockets them. I assume Mary and Lee have already surrendered their phones. We're arrayed outside the inner office because there's not enough room for us all to fit in there. Is there anyone else in the building? The masked man in the office asks Lee. I immediately recognize his voice. It's Jeremy. My limbs go cold, and my alcohol-buzzed head feels light, like it wants to float away. Lee looks at me. Did the other bartenders leave? Yeah, I say, my voice squeaking. That's it, Lee says. There's no one else. Jeremy looks at the guy who came down from upstairs. Out of the corner of my eye, I see the guy shake his head. Why are you lying to me? Jeremy asks. He shifts his pistol and shoots Mary in the face, blasting her brains out all over the inner office wall. Maya screams, but one of the guys backhands her in the mouth. She stumbles back and raises her hands to her mouth, but she stops screaming. I can do nothing but stare at the little bits of gray-pink brain sliding down the bloody wall. This isn't happening, I think. Mary lets out a choked gurgle, her body twitching as blood runs down from the hole in her face. This is happening, some weak voice says in my head. This is happening, and you have to do something or you're all dead. It's my fault that Jeremy's here. It's my fault that Mary's brains are now sliding down the wall. I have no doubt about that. I feel like I'm going to be sick as Jeremy points the gun back at Lee. Let's try this one more time. Is there anyone else left in the bar? This isn't happening. Yes, another manager. His name is Carlo. Is that it? This isn't happening. That's it. Well, I got bad news for you, Jeremy says. Carlo's dead, and you will be too if you don't give me all the money you have in the safe. This isn't happening. It's open, Lee says, gesturing at the small floor safe behind the desk. Oh, good, Jeremy says, just before he shoots Lee in the face. This is fucking happening, the voice screams in my head. Alcohol-fueled, white-hot rage erupts behind my eyes like a volcanic eruption. I move without thinking, throwing my right elbow up into the nearest man's face while I grab his gun hand with my left. Everything happens fast, and I don't have time to think about it until much later. 
The guy's head rocks back as I elbow him, and I manage to pry the gun out of his hand as he stumbles back into the other guy, who tosses Maya aside so he can deal with me. The gun held in my left hand, I aim at Jeremy in the office, even as he's pivoting to point at me. I fire wildly three times, vaguely aware of Jeremy's head jerking back and a fine mist of blood hitting the wall next to him. As the guy I elbowed loses his footing, I launch myself at the other man just as he fires. A hot pain erupts in my upper left arm just a moment before I crash into the man. We slam into the wall and bounce off. As I let myself fall backward, I bring the pistol up and fire three times. That seems to be the magic number, hitting him with all three bullets in the chest. He gasps and fires his gun once, but the bullet is nowhere near me. Meanwhile, the guy I elbowed is scrambling toward me on his hands and knees. I shift the gun and shoot him once in the head. Maya is right behind him as I do this, and she screams, splattered in blood and brains. I get to my feet and lurch over the two dead bodies, grabbing Maya up and dragging her toward the outer office door. As we go, I glance back into the inner office, seeing Jeremy doubled over. He has pulled off his mask to reveal a horrific wound on the side of his face. The bullet tore his left cheek open from the corner of his lip all the way to the back of his jaw, wrecking the teeth on that side and blasting through his ear. He gasps, putting his left hand gingerly to his wound. Just before I lose sight of him, he lifts his pistol toward us. Go! I say to Maya. Go, go, go! We rush out of the office and down the concrete and metal stairs, which are still damp and smell like fabuloso from the nightly mopping they get. When we get to the back door, Maya pushes on it. It opens three inches and then stops against something. It's jammed, she says. I can hear the scrape of a shoe on concrete from up above. Jeremy is coming down. The front, I say, pulling Maya along. As we rush through the kitchen, I glance down and notice the blood on my left arm. It's coming from under my shirt sleeve, from where a bullet either grazed me or went completely through my triceps muscle. Given the throbbing pain now starting to pulse through the adrenaline, I think it's more than just a graze. I transfer the gun from my left to my right hand. It would normally be a straight shot from the kitchen to the front doors through the central courtyard and seating area. But now that the bar has been mostly locked up, the courtyard doors are closed and locked and they require a key to open. So as we exit the kitchen, we take a left to go around the courtyard. In doing so, we'll pass by the bar where Jeremy and I had our altercation the previous night. From behind us, I hear Jeremy shout something that's not quite a sentence. Although I can't make out the words, the hate behind them is as clear as vodka. We move past the stage and through the tables where all the bartenders were sitting when Lee called Maya and me up to the office. When we get to the door between this section and the courtyard, the door that's always left unlocked so people can exit through the front door. I freeze. Through the little panes of glass in the top half of the door closed, I glimpse another man in a mask standing next to the front door so he can't be seen from outside. It's dark in here, so I don't think he's seen us. I also notice that the front door has been chained and locked from the inside. Panic building, I look at the windows in the front wall. They're all locked and require a key to open. We're trapped. Hide, I whisper to Maya raising the gun to point through the glass at the man next to the front door. Maya makes no move. She just stares at me as if I've spoken Latin. There's no time. This is happening. I fire through the glass door, pulling the trigger three times to make sure I hit the guy. He collapses to the floor just as Jeremy comes around the corner. Run! I say, turning toward Jeremy and firing the gun. Maya opens the door I just shot through and starts slamming on the glass of the front door, screaming for help. I'm only partially aware of this because most of my concentration is on Jeremy, who doesn't even try to take cover as I fire at him. I get three shots off before the gun clicks empty, the slide locking back in place. Jeremy keeps coming, blood dripping off his ruined face, the flesh of his cheek flapped open, revealing smashed teeth that still somehow seem like half of a shit-eating grin. As he aims his weapon at me, I realize with horror that I missed with all three shots. I turn to run out into the courtyard as he fires. My right leg goes out just as I reach the open doorway, stumbling into the courtyard and landing next to the door with a scream building in my throat. I look down at my leg, seeing that the knee is a mess of shattered bone, torn sinew, and blood. Maya grabs me under the arms and, surprisingly, lifts me to my feet. I scream as I try to put weight on my leg. She gets on that side and positions herself as a crutch. Upstairs! She says, I can jump over to the war dog and get help. 
The Warthog is the bar we share a wall with, and they have a patio too, although it's about six feet lower than ours. The stairs up to the patio are made of metal and concrete, with a landing halfway up where the stairs reverse direction. I feel like I'm going to pass out by the time we make it to the landing. Surprising myself, I throw the empty gun at Jeremy when he steps into the courtyard below. He ducks back in and the gun misses, but it buys us enough time to get to the top of the stairs. We see Carlo's body near the stairs on the rooftop patio, lying face down in a pool of blood. Go! I say to Maya. Go get help. I can't leave you. I shove her toward the warthog. Go, goddammit! She'll have to climb over a wooden latticework divider between the two patios, something that I can't possibly do in my state. She hesitates for a second before taking off. She's up and over the divider before I'm halfway to the bar Dion and I worked tonight. I just pray there's still someone there who has a phone she can use. I manage to get behind the bar just before Jeremy gets to the top of the stairs. I think I'm clever, hiding behind a fucking bar, until I see the trail of blood I've left behind. It'll lead him straight to me. Since this bar doesn't have any pull-down metal doors or any way to lock it up, we always take all the booze over to the bar on the other side of the patio at the end of the night. That bar is locked up tight with all the booze inside. This means my choices for weapons are plastic bottles of triple sec, lime juice, grenadine, or simple syrup. Then I notice the tip jars sitting on a table next to the register I used. Each tip jar is made from thick glass and is shaped like the thin part of an hourglass at the top. The only way to get money out of them is with a hook or a long spoon. Something occurs to me and I reach back to my right pocket. My bar key is still there. For a bartender, a bar key is like a wallet or a phone. You have it on you so much, you get used to its presence there and you hardly think about it. So I have two weapons, I'll have to make them work. I grab one of the tip jars and position myself behind a heavy metal ice well before peeking up over the bar top. Jeremy is about 15 yards away and he sees me immediately. I drop back down as he fires, the bullets blasting through the wooden bar and thudding into the metal ice well. He fires six shots before stopping. I listen hard for any sound that will give him away, but I don't hear anything. Once again, I stick my head up, but he's not there anymore. With horror, I realize why. Whipping my head to the right, I see him rounding the corner, stepping up to the bar entrance. I fling the tip jar at him and then lurch to my feet, locking my injured leg and using it like a peg. I rush toward him as the glass tip jar bounces off his upraised arm and shatters nearby. The pain in my knee is so sickening that I can't help but let out a scream as I tackle him. We hit the brick patio floor outside the bar and immediately start wrestling for the gun. Jeremy's open cheek is still bleeding everywhere, what's left of his shattered teeth on that side clamped together, blood seeping out of the gums. His eyes are fearfully wide, no sign of his conniving smile left in him. At first, He's using both hands, trying to keep me from getting control of the gun. But he soon changes tack, grabbing my throat with his left hand. The lack of oxygen immediately starts the gears of panic turning in my head. I think about reaching back and grabbing my bar key, but the rounded piece of metal wouldn't be much of a weapon. I could do some damage with it, but only with enough time, which is something I don't have. A ring of shifting black spikes is already encroaching on my vision. I don't have any time. I take my right arm away from the gun and punch him in the wounded side of his face. He grunts, but doesn't let go of my neck. I feel his grip tighten. This isn't happening. I'm going to die. I try to pull away to get the gun to do anything, but I can't breathe. I'm losing consciousness. I slap at the side of his face with my right hand, but it does nothing. My vision is down to pinpoints fixed on Jeremy's damaged face as if I'm seeing him through a reversed set of binoculars. Then, even those pinpoints are gone, and I can see nothing. I feel my brain shutting down, and all my energy seems to be going toward keeping the gun away from me. Not that it matters, now that I'm being choked to death. I slap at him weakly once more, and my right hand flops down to the brick patio. I feel pinpricks of pain on the back of my hand. It's glass shattered glass from the tip jar. This is fucking happening, a strangled voice in my brain says. With what energy I have left, 
I grab a handful of shattered glass and then slap it down onto Jeremy's face, grinding it into his eyes. He screams and lets go of my throat, moving that hand down to my wrist. I inhale a harsh and painful breath, my vision coming back with the intake of oxygen. Jeremy writhes, yanking at my right wrist. Then, in his mad scramble to stop the pain I'm inflicting, he lets go of the gun. I yank the gun away and pull myself off of him, falling back toward the bar entrance as Jeremy sits up, bringing his hands to his bloody eyes. Glass sticks out of his eyelids and he drags his fingers across, pulling pieces of glass out and doing more damage in the process. Maybe realizing he no longer has the gun, he stumbles to his feet, still screaming, and heads off. I get the gun into my right hand and aim it at him, but I don't fire. Instead, I get painfully to my feet and step around the bar, watching him as he runs into the metal tables set around the patio. Finally, he makes his way to the stairs, but since he can't see, he trips and tumbles down the staircase, hitting the landing hard. He doesn't move after that. I limp to the nearest table and pull out a chair. From here, I can see down into the courtyard to the front door. So I watch a police car pull up, lights flashing. Soon, an ambulance pulls up behind the squad car. I slump down into the chair and breathe a sigh of relief through my painful throat. <sighs> Jeremy didn't die, but Texas has the death penalty, so he will probably be executed sometime in the next 15 years. I don't know what's worse, being executed by the state or living in prison with only one good eye and an atrocious, crooked smile created by the reconstruction job the doctors did on his face. As it turns out, he's a career criminal, and the police tied his little crew to home invasions, robberies, and even a couple of missing persons cases. I'll have a limp for the rest of my life, but it's not too bad. The bullet that hit my arm was a through and through, so it could have been worse. Maya and I have grown closer after that night. I guess that's common for people who experience trauma together. We still work at the bar, for now anyway. And although we don't drink most nights, we'll occasionally have a shot or two at the end of a shift. And when we do, we always raise our cups to Lee, Mary, and Carlo. They are sorely missed. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.